We begin a new series today entitled Rest for the Weary. Can anyone relate to being weary in the room today? Just me? Over the course of the next three weeks, we'll be looking at this text. I know there's only three verses in this text, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge you as we, I begin this series. Would you join me in memorizing these three verses? Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30. I'm going to encourage you, challenge you in your own time, in your own devotional time with Jesus, that these words would penetrate your mind and Drop down into your heart, and these are the words, Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. Jesus says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. These three verses we'll look at over the course of the next few weeks, because... I believe we all could benefit from a little bit of rest. I don't know what you brought into the room today. If you're feeling overwhelmed, if you're feeling exhausted, if you're feeling like you can't keep up, you can't measure up, you're trying to get up earlier in the morning and you stay up later trying to produce and earn and work, I want you to know you are, you are welcome here. If you feel like when you walked into the room, you had to have it all together, if that's you, then you and I are very, very different because I do not have it all together. My prayer is that by God's grace, I might be able to share a few things that I've learned in this area in my life. In 2010, I hit a wall. Maybe some of you can relate. I, I experienced burnout. And I crashed, and it wasn't good. I had been in ministry for a number of years, and I was finding my worth and my value in my title and in my job. Uh, Self-proclaimed workaholic. I don't know if anyone else can relate to that. Maybe you grew up in a home with a parent, a workaholic, and that's part of my story. And happy if we share coffee or a meal, I could go into greater depths of that story, but that's part of my background, and I'm so grateful by God's grace, he allowed me to learn a few things through that season. It was an extremely difficult season. I had to work through some things in my marriage, work through some things personally where I found my worth and where I found my value. I was a people pleaser. I felt like I had to do everything somebody asked me to do. I felt like Um, I I had to make everybody happy, and uh, you know where that led. You know where that leads. 2010, I I burned out, and by God's grace, he taught me a few things. Number one, we're going to look at here, has everything to do with, with my identity and my worth. Some of you maybe have found meaning, and you found purpose, and a meaningful job, and work is good. Maybe you have you, put, you found yourself at some season of your life, you're putting a little more too much worth and value in that. I remember um, having conversations in, in our family. I have three adult daughters now, but when they were infants and toddlers and early elementary, they would share stories of things. My wife would share stories of things. And I, I would say, yeah, I don't remember that. I don't remember that. Tell me more, because I was absent. I wasn't there. I was serving other people's kids. And I was missing my own. And there were some deep wounds I had to work through, not only my own wounds, but the wounds of, of the people I love the most had to work through that as well. Where's dad? He's doing, doing ministry. There are many, many good things God can call us to, but may not be the great things. The great things in my life today, more important than anything else, first and foremost, my relationship with Jesus. Then he calls me to be a husband next. He calls me to be a parent, a father, even though they're adults. You never stop being a dad. 
And then I'm a friend. I have some friends, really good friends, that will long outlast my job here at Boulder Mountain. And then after that, I, I get the opportunity to be your pastor. I believe it is in that order. And for many years in ministry, I had that order all jumbled up and mixed up. And again, I'm grateful for God's grace sharing some things in my life. That's an area that I will continue to work on for the rest of my life. I'm going to share some things, some principles from Scripture today that I think will benefit all of us and will be a reminder to me. Because I don't know if anybody else here in this room is tired today. Weary. One translation, this, what I read here in the ESV, who labor, work, produce. Those are the things we agree to. I've signed up for this job description, I, and then I say yes to all these other things. I'm overcommitted, overextended. These labor, these are the things I've, I've agreed to, I've signed up for, I've said yes to. One translation says weary. I kind of like the weary word. And are heavy laden. Now, heavy laden is the burden everybody else places on me. And, and you have two lists. You have a list of things you, you have to do tomorrow morning, long list of things that you've signed up for, you've agreed to, you've said yes to somebody. And then there's a much longer list of everybody who has things for you to do. Two lists. One you've agreed to, and the other is everybody placing Heavy laden, burdened. This is so heavy, I can't keep up. Anybody ever relate to, I can't keep up. I, I even get up earlier in the morning and then I stay up later at night and I, I keep falling farther and farther behind. It doesn't matter your age. You might be retired and you feel weary and burdened and overworked. And you might be in high school and you have the responsibilities of your parents and your coaches and your teachers and it never ends. You're working jobs and it's like, I can't keep up. I can't juggle all of these things. If that's you today, you're in really good company because that's most of us in this room. Whether we choose to admit it or not, there are many times of our life we are weary and burdened and overwhelmed and exhausted. And there's good news. There's good news. Jesus says, come to me. A number of months ago, I had my laptop open at the kitchen table and the, the desktop was there and my wife walked by and she's like, oh my word, how can you live with that? <laughs> That is so unorganized. That is a mess. I have anxiety just looking at that. We all roll a little bit differently, right? I've got folders and I've got downloaded stuff. I don't know where it is. I just know it's somewhere on my laptop and I'll search for it when I need it. But then you, you zeroed in at the little bottom there, the emails. <laughs> now her heart's beating faster. Her hands are sweaty. We, we all manage things a little bit differently. This, this is my world heading up into Easter. And uh, so this is my, my daughter's email account. She's, she is 22, and I don't know if they fully understand email. You know, they, sign, they, they sign up for different things, but you don't ever really need to look at it. And so emails never stop, right? There's always somebody else emailing you and wanting your attention, wanting your time. And, and then now there's text messages too, right? And then uh, this is her, her text messages. There's somebody in our young adult group that can relate to this too. Maybe not check every text. I check the texts that uh, are, are important to me. Um, but it never stops. And now there's 10 other methods of communication with social media. And, oh, I messaged you on LinkedIn. I messaged you on Messenger. I, I DM'd you. Or it's like, I, I can't keep up. And I'm, I'm trying to juggle all of these things. And I'm, I'm going to disappoint some people. And I want you to know that there is good news for all of us today. This last image here. I think might be where a lot of us relate to the most, and that is I am, I'm dead. I'm tired. Uh, you know, when it comes to our devices, our phones, and our laptops, they get more input than we do as people. They at least tell us when I'm about to die. Warning, 20%. Heads up, you're now at 10%. And then they crash. And then you know what it forces us to do? We stop. 
What's telling you that you are at 5%? What is the indicator in your life saying, you better stop? It's the engine light on our car dashboard that you can't just put duct tape over it, as my sister might have done growing up. You can't just hide it and act like it's not there. It's a warning, and we are human beings, not human doings. We're human beings, and we all need rest. We all need a rhythm, a habit of rest for our souls. It's not just physical rest, not just talking about emotional rest, although that is really, really important. There is spiritual rest we're going to zero in on today. Like, what's, what's spiritual rest? Well, I'm glad you asked. Spiritual rest. Jesus says, come to me. This is, this is as personal of an invitation as you could ever get. Uh, we probably, if we check our inbox, there's probably some invitations that you have in your inbox. It might be to a wedding. It might be to a birthday party. It might be to an Easter gathering last week. It might, you have an invitation. That's so nice. Somebody thought of you. There's a, you're privileged to be invited in. It's, it's, a nice, it's a nice thing to be invited this is an extremely personal invitation by Jesus Christ, by the Son of God, who says to you this morning directly, come to me. Come to me. And the requirement to come to Jesus is not that you have it all together. It is actually the opposite. The, the opportunity to come to Jesus, what is to be required in this passage? To be weary. You get to come to Jesus if you're weary and weary and burdened, and overwhelmed. It's, it's an extremely personal invitation. Now, why can Jesus say, come to me and I will give you rest? What gives him the right to do that? A few things. He has credibility to give you and I rest. He lived it. Spends 32, 33 years approximately on this world, only three years of a full-time vocational ministry, he got a lot of things done. He was a very busy man, but Jesus was never hurry. He was never hurried. He was never worried, and he was always at peace. He got a lot of things done. He was, he was busy, but he wasn't hurried. He also models for us what does it mean to live in this world that is not our home. One day we're going home, eternal home. Today, it's our temporary home. It's our temporary home. The pace of Jesus. A few times where Jesus chose solitude over people. As we go through this passage, we're going to kind of camp out in the book of Matthew, but I want to bring you to a few times where Jesus, who is the Son of God, if he's choosing solitude and silence over people, what does that say about you and I? How much do you and I need to be alone and to be silent? We ended our Good Friday service uh, a little over a week ago. with We exited the room in silence, something we, we hadn't normally done. We tried it. And I was surprised. About a half a dozen people came and said, oh, that was so nice. I really enjoyed leaving in silence. That was like a minute and 30 seconds to leave this room. That tells you how little, how infrequently we are silent. I'm going to intentionally choose to be quiet in this moment and as, as we left. And then you could start talking. But how often, when was the last time I chose, I'm just going to be quiet. Or I chose to, to get alone. These are a few times when Jesus intentionally chose solitude. Luke 4, number one, to prepare for a major task. After Jesus was baptized, he spent 40 days praying in the wilderness. 40 days. Some of us in the room, if we're honest, we haven't given that four minutes. We haven't given four minutes to be alone. And he goes out. 40 days to prepare for a major task. What was the task? It was his purpose, why he came. Before he begins his three years of ministry, he gives 40 days. After being around people, he got away. 
If you've ever felt like, I just, I'm done with these people, I need to get away. It's okay, you're in really good company. Jesus did the same. Jesus met with a lot of people. He healed a lot of people. He ministered to a lot of people. He also walked away from a lot of people. That's okay. After being around people, there were years ago, I, I thought I could, I could do a lot of things. I thought I didn't have any limitations. I'll do a funeral, and then I'll go do a wedding, and then I'll come back and I'll do another funeral. And, I, I just, and now I've realized, by God's grace, he's taught me some rhythms. When I am, especially after emotionally draining service like a funeral, I need space. I need some time to heal. My wife and I know, hey, I have a funeral in the morning. That means I need a few hours before we jump into another family event or gathering. Or I've learned some things. Jesus got away from people. Jesus, in Matthew 14, he worked through grief by getting away and, and getting alone. Some of us, we haven't grieved properly. After he learned that his cousin John the Baptist had been beheaded, he went away by himself. Yes, even the Son of God grieves. Before he made an important decision in Luke 6, he, he got away. He, he got away. The next day, he spent the whole night in prayer, and the next day, he chose his 12 disciples. In a time of distress, hours before Jesus was arrested, he went to the Mount of Olives, and he went a short distance away from his disciples to pray. He was in great emotional agony, knowing what he was about to face. Luke 5, last one, he got away to focus on prayer. Jesus has every credibility to give you a personal invitation for you to come to him. If you're weary, if you're burdened, if you're exhausted, if you're overwhelmed, Jesus says to you today, come to me. It is so personal. He doesn't say, hey, come to the temple. He doesn't say, come to the church. He doesn't say, come to the Pharisees. He doesn't say, come to Moses. He says, come to me. He, another place in Matthew, he tells the children, right? Let them come to me. Let them come to me. Personal invitation. And it is a beautiful invitation. It is an egalitarian invitation, meaning it is, it is for everyone. It is for all. Do you know what all means in Greek? All. That, that went up better over at the earlier service. <laughs> it's everyone. The requirement is that you're broken and weary, not that you have it together. You, you, you come to Jesus. In the book, Gentle and Lowly, one of the top five books I've read in maybe the last 10 years, I, I highly recommend it. Dane Ortland says, meek, humble, and gentle. Jesus is not trigger happy. He's not harsh. He's not reactionary. He's, easily, he's not easily exasperated. He is the most understanding person in the universe. The posture most natural to him is not a pointed finger, but open arms. You are invited to come to Jesus, to fall at his feet, and to give him all the exhaustion and all the grief and all the drained batteries. You can give that to him. What is Jesus doing in this passage? He's actually quoting Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16. Let me read it for you. Jeremiah 6, 16. This is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look. Some of us might be there. We've got a crossroads with a career, with a job that you just can't measure up, you can't keep up, and you're at a crossroads. You're feeling the weight of everyone else's expectations. It says, ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it. And then Jeremiah 6 says, this is given to Judah. And you will find rest for your souls. Jesus repeats, quotes from Jeremiah 6 and says, come to me. I will give you rest for your souls. Now, Jesus is talking about more than a, a day off of work. Day off work's important. It's part of the rhythms of life. He's talking about a spiritual rest. A spiritual rest. Doctors and researchers will tell you it's not about the length of sleep that you get at night. Have you ever felt like, oh, I just 
I got off vacation. Why am I so tired? I just slept for 12 hours last night. Why am I so tired? Because it's not about the length of rest. It's about the depth of rest. It's the REM sleep. And Jesus, spiritually speaking, is the REM sleep of rest that each and every one of us crave. What does that look like and where is that found? Jesus, first and foremost, this is really important. As Jesus begins his ministry, before he gets really, really, really busy, he goes out for 40 days, and I believe he's listening to the word of God in, in the desert. He understands his identity. His identity was known and determined. He was fully aware who he was. If we don't get that right, everything else afterwards is going to be a mess. That job that you really, really want, you start that job, and it will be a rat race. You'll never get out of if you don't understand where your ultimate identity comes from. Jesus had his baptism, comes up out of the water, and what does his Father in heaven say? This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. In Jesus, you and I are treated like sons of God as Jesus is treated by his Father. So Jesus... Today, the father says to you, my daughter in whom I am, I am well pleased, my son in whom I'm well pleased. That is a statement from heaven for you today. Your worth and your value is found in your identity in Christ, not in how well you perform or how much you produce or how many hours you worked last week. If we don't get this right, it's going to really mess us up. We will never find rest. You will always be striving for worth and value from other people. And that is so draining. And I don't want that for you. God doesn't want that for you. Jesus says, come to me. Come to me. Jesus knew his identity. His identity was, was settled. Do not get amnesia on who you are in Christ. You are not that important. And I had to realize when I went through this, I am not that important and I am not that powerful. Jesus knew who his identity was. He also knew his purpose. Do you know your identity and do you know your purpose? Jesus was not deterred from the purpose that he was created and why he, why not created, but why he was sent to earth. His purpose was ultimately the resurrection, which was the cross to the resurrection. And there were a lot of people that wanted other things from him. Are you going to do this? Are you going to do that? You came to save us? Are you going to keep save us politically? from the, A lot of other people wanted other things for him, but he was determined and he was settled in what his purpose is. Listen, purpose answers a lot of the expectations from other people upon us. When I became a pastor here at Boulder Mountain, I was a member of two different boards, nonprofits. That really good. I really believe in their mission. I had the opportunity to sit on the boards, and I, I had fun sitting on the boards. I, I enjoyed it. But God said in my, in my time with him, he said, it's time to step off those boards for your purpose is to be the pastor of this church that I've called you to. I'm like, I don't want to. I really enjoy all this stuff over here. But that is taking time away from what I've called you to do. Purpose is really, really important. Do you know the purpose that God's called you to? Do you know what that is? It's not 10 things. What's the one thing God has called you to do? And then that will dictate on what you say yes to and what you say no to. It is exhausting to try to meet the purpose of everybody else for your life. That, that, that will never end. Trying to measure up and say yes to what everybody else wants for you. But do you know your identity and do you know your purpose? Those are really, really important. It's a personal invitation. It's for everyone. What qualifies you to come to Jesus is your weariness. It's your heaviness. Not come to me, those who have it together. Not come to me, all those who are morally strong or who obey really well. All you need is me. All you need is brokenness. Fall down at Jesus. The final thing is restorative. His rest is restorative. Restorative, first four letters of that word, rest. You can't get restored until there is rest. Now, when we talk about rest, we're not just talking about sitting in a lazy boy. Right? The worldly concept of rest is you work, 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 exhaustion, you come home, you crash on the couch, you eat really bad food, and you put on 
and a binge a Netflix series. That is not rest. Is it okay to do that once in a while? That's, that's for you to figure out, right? It's not rest, though. That's not what Jesus is saying. I want to give you six series to binge watch. It's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, I want to give you rest that is life-giving, that, that brings freedom from everyone else's expectations. I want to give you true rest. The deep REM type of rest. When I find out who I really am and my purpose, that gives me the ability to say yes to God and at times when needed, no to other people. You have the confidence. Now, we all, you're always kind to people. Don't be a jerk for Jesus. Be clear and be kind, right? The clarity of my purpose and my identity is going to dictate what I agree to and what I don't agree to. So, so be clear, but be kind too. But you, you have the freedom, I'm giving you the freedom today. You don't have to say yes to everything. There are some really good things in your life that you could say yes to. You don't have to. Say yes to the great things. The great things. Now, Jesus talks about, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke. Yoke, very foreign object in our culture today. We usually see it at a, a restaurant that has farm ambiance in it, like a cracker barrel. You walk in, there may be a yoke hanging on the wall, or maybe a bed and breakfast. You've got, you see yokes, or we, yokes are not part of our normal everyday life. So what's Jesus talking about? Common, the culture that he was speaking to, everybody knew what a yoke was. A yoke is connected two wild beasts together, oxen, right, mules, even horses at times. And what Jesus is saying, take my yoke upon you, what he's actually saying in the original context, he's saying, I'm, you are yoked to something. Everyone in this room is yoked to something. We're yoked to the public opinion, what people think about us. We're yoked to, to personal expectations. We're yoked to what your boss wants you to do and how you to do it and when to do it. We're yoked to these things. Trying to make everybody happy. I'm, I'm trying to be a people pleaser. I'm yoked to that. There's yokes that we're all connected to that come from this world. And let me tell you, those yokes will ultimately kill you. If I yoke myself to a horse, let me give you the example, it's not going to end well for me. I'll eventually be pulled and dragged. And so Jesus is saying, don't just take my yoke. He's saying, exchange the yoke. I'm, I'm going to take the yoke that you're enslaved to, and I'm going to give you a new yoke, and this yoke is going to be so much better. And you're going to learn from me. This is discipleship. Jesus says, you're going to learn from me. You're going to follow me as, as I walk with you. Take my yoke, for my yoke is gentle. It's easy. I'm going to, I'm going to walk with you. We're going to learn from Jesus. We're going to learn from Jesus and the rhythm of rest. Now, the biblical model and rhythm of rest is not what I just described of work, 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 and then collapse and rest. Adam's first day on earth was a day of rest. He worked out of his rest. Rest should prepare us for the week to come, not Recover from the week behind. This is a really important concept for us to understand. Otherwise, we'll never get true rest. My first day, right? Whatever day, the principle of rest is really important. It's found through all throughout Scripture. It doesn't have to be a one-day, 24-hour period of time. If it is for you, great. But the principle of rest, that you and I cannot run 24-7. God does not want that for you. Other people want that for you, but ultimately you will suffer and the closest relationships in your life will suffer. And eventually that will take toll on us physically as well. I talk to people all the time because I've been there. I worked 90 hours last week and my boss doesn't understand and this and that, right? Monday's coming and I'm trying to keep... You are more productive when you rest. You're a better employee you're a better husband. You're a better wife when you rest, when you take time for yourself. Tell them what you need. Tell those closest to you, hey, I, I need some time here. I'm, 
I'm drained. My engine light's flashing. I'm on empty. My phone needs to be plugged in. Whatever the analogy that works for you, just admit it. Jesus' identity was settled. He relied on the word of God. He was confident in his father's purpose. It is so difficult in today's age in the culture in which we live to find rest because I, I'm overwhelmed when I turn a screen on. It is so overwhelming. What we're living is the prophecy from Daniel 12, verse 4, that says there's a day coming where everybody will know everything and they will travel to and fro. That is today. Everything and anything I want to know is in my pocket. I can pull it out, pull it up, Google it. And we can fly anywhere within a day. We can be anywhere in the world. That is prophesied in Daniel 12, verse 4. There's a day coming where everybody's going to know everything. We were not designed to do that. You and I were not designed to carry the weight of every nat- natural tragedy that happens in the world. When, when an earthquake hits somewhere in the Middle East, we know about it within five minutes. Now I have to carry that weight. I have to think about it. It overwhelms my thoughts. And, and I listen to the news. Listen, for most of the world, for most of the time, people knew what was happening within five miles of where they lived and where they grew up. And they were wearied and overburdened. That's when Jesus speaks to people who lived where they grew up, where they were born. They never left more than 20 miles away from there where they grew up. And Jesus is saying, come to me, you who are weary and overburdened. If that was the case then, how much more so today? That is, that is overwhelming. I can't process that. You and I today will digest 90% more information than they did in 1940 in one day. Right? That's just 80 years ago. 90 times more information we're consuming. And we wonder why we're tired and weary and overwhelmed. We're, we're not, we weren't designed to know everything that happens in the world to everybody. I got in trouble just figuring out my own life. Finally, Jesus knew where his home was. His home, Hebrews 13, verse 14, for this world is not our home. We are looking forward to an everlasting home in heaven. Listen, this world, we're just passing through. This is not our ultimate resting place. There's a day coming where we will, we will be home. And I don't think we'll need rest. We won't need sleep. But we're not there yet. We're to steward and manage the resources, the body, the time that God has given to us and to do that to the best of our ability. And that begins with understanding who you are in Christ first and foremost. Everything else flows out of that. Number two, it begins understanding the purpose that God has created you for. You cannot do everything. You are not everything to everyone else. You know how God wired you. You know how God made you. And you, and you say, this is, this is what God's called me to do. And exchange the yoke of everyone else's expectations and everyone else's to-do list and the people-pleasing yoke that some of us wear. Exchange that for the yoke of Jesus. And it is so freeing. And every day, you can have a finish line. There will always be more emails. There will always be more texts. There will always be more requests from your boss at work. That will never end. But for most of us in this room, you will outlast your job. And so do not make choices. Do not make eternal decisions that allow your job to prioritize over family relationships and, and more than that, over your relationship with Jesus. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. I pray that we find rest today. I'm just going to ask if there's anybody in the room today feeling overwhelmed, exhausted, burned out. If you get worried about Monday coming. Would you just raise your hand? I'm raising my hand here. Thank you. Thank you. That takes courage. I'm going to pray for you. And if somebody next to you, you saw their hand go up, you may not know their name, would you just pray for them? Father, I pray that the Holy Spirit would minister to them right now. 
Father, I pray that you would give them an overwhelming sense of who they are in Jesus. This is my daughter in whom I'm well pleased. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased, not because of what they have done, but because of who they are and whose they are. God, I pray for the hands that were raised, that there would be an exchange this morning, that walking out of this room, we'd walk out in freedom. That we would find rest. And as we go through this series, we develop maybe some healthy rhythms and habits that, that bring about so much freedom. God, I thank you that your son modeled this for us and that we can come to Jesus and we can find rest for our souls. We look forward to the day where you call us home, whether that's through the rapture of Jesus or that's, that's uh, through this world us passing through the shadow of death. One day we'll be in your kingdom, Father. Until then, teach us these things. May we learn from Jesus. I pray, Holy Spirit, continue to comfort and minister in the next few moments in this room. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to take a moment to say thank you for joining us for today's service online. I'm going to invite you to our website where there are a number of different action steps to take following today's service. Maybe joining a small group or finding a place to serve, sending a prayer request into the church to let us know how we can help you and how we can be praying for you. If you found this message today encouraging and supportive, I'm going to ask you to like or share or comment and let us know and, and share that with your friends. If it's been an encouragement to you, I trust you'll be an encouragement to others as you share this resource. Hey, we've been praying for you. We're going to continue to pray for you throughout this week and trust you'll join us again next weekend. Have a great week.